those who are new to be with us. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor or a long-time member or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your row. You might have a record of your tenants with us on this Lord's Day. We're glad that you are with us. Let me call for your attention. A few announcements from the opportunities page. Uh, and you may look at the rest of them at your leisure, but let me call a few just directly to your attention. One of the things you find in the uh, announcements this time is a, a sheet from the poinsettias. Uh, this is from the Cape Upton Circle. Uh, you may give a poinsettia in honor or in memory of a loved one. We'll encourage you to do that if you feel led. Uh, the deadline is Wednesday, I believe, so we will encourage you to, to do that if you feel led. Uh, Wednesday night supper will be a good one, but it's the last one of uh, 2018. So we hope you'll come out and be a part of that. Uh, the River City Rangers uh, have uh, the handbill, uh, have a concert coming up on the 14th at First Christian Church at 7 o'clock. And we've got several of our folks who are part of that group, and we encourage you to come out and support them as you feel led. Uh, speaking of music, next Sunday at the 11 o'clock hour, Chancel Choir will be presenting their cantata. I've been listening to them practice, and they're going to be real good, I can tell you. So come out and, and support them again as you feel led. I want to thank you for the donation you have given to the coats for Matthew 25 drive. I think it's made a big difference. Uh, you still have an opportunity to contribute, to be a part of that as you feel led. They'll be distributed next week. And there's information in there on how you may be a part of that. And also to, on behalf of the Channel's Missional Community, remind you that there's a blood drive coming up on Wednesday the 19th, which is Wednesday week, and in the Fellowship Hall. If you'd like to be a part of that, there's contact information. Uh, we want to help uh, the folks in the community, uh, to, uh, and the hospitals in the community. Uh, they always need blood, particularly this time of year, so we want to encourage you to participate in that as you feel like are there other announcements? All right. If not, we'll invite uh, Lee and Nancy Hemmett to come up and to light our Advent brief for this second Sunday of Advent. Last Sunday, we said the word Advent means coming, and that each week we will light a candle representing a person who played a significant role in the Advent Christmas story. You are no doubt preparing your home for the coming of Christmas, but are you preparing your hearts for the coming of Christ? That was the question, the person whose candle we light today. First, we relight the Isaiah candle or the candle of hope. Today we light another of the purple candles. This is the John the Baptist candle, sometimes called the candle of preparation, because John the Baptist was the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. May we prepare not just our homes, but our lives to make room for Christ to be born in us anew and afresh this Christmas.
snap down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Detail away by the voice and the desert Make straight the path of the be our prayer, and in all the celebration we might make a straight path into our hearts to receive you anew and afresh, the gift that we give ourselves, laid at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. We've been talking about um, our manger scene and how we've moved the wise men, and we'll move them in just a minute. And today I brought up a bag. What usually comes in this? A present, a Christmas present. And, you know, um, we have a very special present that comes this year at Christmas. And it says in Luke 1, 76 through 79, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation. Through the forgiveness of our sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And we are those people that live in darkness. And Jesus is the light. And John the Baptist was saying, we're going to prepare the way for him, and that preparing the way is going to be in our hearts. And so today, as we think about this special time, I did bring a little something for you so you can remember. You want to pass those down? You can put this on your tree, and it will help you remember that it's our Lord Jesus Christ who was the best gift of all, the best gift. So we're going to go move the wise men, and we're going to move them. And we have three of you to get a wise I'm so glad. <laughs> And we're going to move them to the middle window. So let's walk over that way, okay? Come on. And you know, the wise men had quite a journey. And I was also just reading in one of my devotionals about Mary and Joseph and the long journey that they had. And it probably took them as long as seven days, actually, on their journey. So you may choose whichever one you want. You get the one that's left, Drew. Uh -huh. <laughs> and come on, let's travel this way. And we're going to land right here. So before we go back to our seats, let's just have a little prayer. And we can just pray right here. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Jesus. we thank you. We thank you. For the, best gift of all. For the best gift of all, your son. In his name, we say, Amen. Thank you.
Good morning. I guess our first praise ought to be that we dodged a bullet in the weather this morning. Uh, we were just up north and visiting our son up north and had 13 inches of snow. and So uh, I had all the snow that I, was, I needed. So thank you, dear Lord. Any other praises and prayers this morning? Start over here. Not one praise and prayer. Come on, folks. How about the middle in here? Is it me? <laughs> oh, we got one. All right. I would like to ask some praises and prayers for our military and our military families all over the world. This morning, I would like to direct your attention to the American flag. On the flag is draped a five foot by two and three quarters inches black morning ribbon. Uh, it is acceptable to hang such a ribbon on, a, on an American flag that is not capable of being lowered to half staff. This, this ribbon represents uh, uh, our mourning for our 41st president, George H.W. Bush, and the flag will fly a half staff here in the church and elsewhere in our community until the end of this year. Thank you very much. You know, I've said this before, but uh, I sure appreciate you remembering our all the people that uh, do a lot of good things for us and and help. We thank you for reminding us of that. I'd like to ask continue prayers for our son and son-in-law. This will be Christmas season that they're out of away from our fam their families, um, so it's tough on families and them as they're in Afghanistan. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Prayers for the Watson family. They are neighbors of my parents over in Winterville. Um, after several months of strokes, um, Carol ended up being taken off of life support yesterday and uh -huh. passed away yesterday evening. How about over here? I appreciate Pastor Ken's uh, comments on the blood drive. I uh, would like to encourage anybody that's able to give to give. Uh, in speaking with the Red Cross, uh, we have less than half of what our normal blood reserves are. And so it's important, especially this time of year, that we give the gift of life. And so if you're interested in giving, uh, you can go to uh, redcrossblood.org or you can call Lee and I. I encourage your support. Thank you. One last praise for me is I've been a member of this church, my wife and I, for many years. But you know, I still get the same warm feeling walking through that door. And uh, would you want to join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
took care of Sam, and he keeps me out of trouble, so thank God for that. We are thrilled that Bruce is with us today to share with us as we conclude our time of reflection on God's goodness to us, especially this season, and our response to that. So, Brother Bruce, you know to share with us this morning. I was feeling bad about uh, bringing the snow down from Raleigh until Rick got up and said he brought it down from north. So I feel somewhat relieved this morning. It's my joy to be with you this day and to share with the, the things that we understand. When Ken first called me and asked me if I would do this, I was reluctant. I'd been sick most of the summer. And I told him if he would pray hard and I'd get well, I'd try to do it. So he must have fulfilled both of those promises. This mic is going to bother me if I don't move it. That's better. Yeah. I want to tell you something. I ran into a story I liked some time ago. Little boy, his mother would take him to church every Sunday. She'd never go with him, but she'd drop him off for Sunday school and scurry on about her business. And after Sunday school was over, she'd come back and pick him up and take him home week after week after week. So she dropped him off one Sunday morning, and when she came back to pick him up, he jumped in the car and he was all excited. And she said, uh, what did they teach you in Sunday school this morning? And she said, Mama, it was great. Just absolutely great. Pharaoh's army were chasing Israelites. And they were running them across the desert for all they were worth. And they came up on this hole of water and it was red. I don't know why it was red. Maybe somebody bled in it. But I don't really know about that, Mama, but it was the Red Sea. That's what they called it. And they uh, didn't know what to do. And Pharaoh's army just kept coming and coming and coming. And so finally, in desperation, they called on the Corps of Engineers. And they jumped out and they built a pontoon bridge all across the Red Sea. And all the people of Israel went across the bridge. And then, Mama, they called out the four sea boys with the big packs of dynamite. And they mined the bridge. And when Pharaoh's army got right in the middle, they blew it up and killed them all. And she looked at him and she said, Son, is that what they told you in church? He said, No, Mama. But if I would tell you the way they told me, you wouldn't believe it either. <laughs> and when we come to talk about the manifold grace of God and what God does to us and the opportunities that God has laid on us and the responsibilities that God calls us to fulfill, if I tell you what the biblical text says, you may not believe it either. I'm going to do my best to do that this morning. For the Bible says that we are the stewards, the caretakers, the managers of the manifold promises of God, of all the gifts that God has given to us, of all the treasures that we hold, of all of those things that God has blessed our life with, from breath to creation to redeeming love, saving grace, and ultimately to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit to do exactly what God has called us to do. Most of us don't believe it. I'm reading a book at the house. It's written by a Presbyterian and I didn't really want it. But I've been asked to teach a Sunday school class for two Sundays and I said, nah. And the lady that asked me to teach, she's so gracious. It's hard to say no. And she always uses that last line. But but you're a good preacher. You ought to do this for me. I'm not sure what she means by good, but I'll leave it there. But I was reading the book, and he said that we never, ever in the Presbyterian church worship as we should. That was his first sentence in chapter 5. And I read that and I said, I've got to teach that. I've got to stand up in a Methodist church before a Sunday school class and say we never worship God as we should in church. But she's right. And that author's right. For you see, what you and I are called to do is to be and to understand that God is the very bedrock of our faith. We have no faith apart from Him. We're deeply, absolutely responsible to God for His commitment, not mine, 
but for his commitment that I am going to be a child of his. He reaches the down and does it. I was raised in Robinson County. My grandfather was a farmer. And I used to say as a little boy, Granddaddy, why do you do this? And he said, to make some money so I can feed kids like you. And so I'd watch him, you know, he would pair, prepare the fur and then he would break the center and then he would come along with his cedar and it would drop a seed. And then he'd cover it up. And then he'd go home and wait. And sometimes wait. You see, he planted the seed, but he did not water it. And he did not put life in that seed. The amazing thing that the responsibility to do that is God. And what God did to each of us, He reached down in our lives and He gave us a gift. And that gift touched our heart and that gift is the grace of God. And by God's grace and God's love, He gave us everything. He did not ask you to sacrifice. We were talking about the black on the cross of the flag. And I thought to myself, man, my granddaddy was at D-Day. And my daddy said that when he came off the beach a day and a half after going on, he had to walk on dead bodies to get back to the landing craft. And he said, I've never in my life witnessed such a sacrifice. And he wouldn't go to church because he wouldn't understand how God could allow something like that to happen. Do you not understand that Christ paid the price more than anyone else on that beach that day. For that man that we know, Jesus Christ, died just for you. He loved you sight unseen, generations and years to follow. He died on a cross outside of Jerusalem because He loved you. And He said, My gift to you is the gift of eternal life. And my charge to you is to use it wisely with wisdom because you are the stewards of the mysteries of God. What do you see in your own life? What do you feel in your own life? Who do you think you are? I used to feel pretty good about myself in many respects. My ego was great when that little old lady told me I was a great preacher. The DS said, yeah, I'm going to put you in a four-point appointment, four-church appointment down in Bladen County. Let's see how good you are. But God was with us, and God was close to us. You see, when we talk about the grace of God, it's because He loved you. And He has given you the responsibility to love others on His behalf. You are the keepers of the grace of God. And some of us are like we keep our glasses. We open our coat, we take them off, we stick them in our shirt pocket. And our wife says, get your glasses before we leave. And like I did this morning, where are they? I don't know. What did you do with them? I don't know. Didn't you put them in your shirt pocket? Oh yeah, that's where they are. And we do that with the grace of God. We pull it out when we need it. And that's the absolute reverse of what God has asked us to do. You are the keepers of the mysteries of God. You are those who proclaim the unsearchable riches of a gift from God. And that gift is eternal life. You're called to witness, to share, to give, to respond, to act, to be. To be what? What is it God has called each and every one of us to be? A good guy? Don't think so. A good preacher? No. He's called us to be stewards, keepers, 
managers, managers, leaders, proclaimers, witnesses to, and a hundred other ways that you could say the very same thing. So what does it, what is it, what did he do, what does he expect, and what does he ask out of you? To be a good singer? Don't think so. To attend every Sunday and warm up you? Don't think so. To throw a couple of the dollars in the plate on Sunday morning? Nope. To go to the hospital to see a freak, sick friend? Nope. Well then, what is it? What is it when he whispers to you in the coolness of the night? When you can't sleep and your heart is heavy and you toss and you turn? And he simply says, you're mine. I own you. I paid the price. I bought you with my blood. And all I want you to do is to be my steward. I want you to be the keepers of the mysteries of God. My wife and I had the privilege to go to London and to be a part of a World Methodist Conference there. And as a part of that, we were able to tour part of the Tower of London. And some of us in the room wanted to see the throne. And we did. And my wife, the first thing I know, she's up on the stage behind the throne seat. And the guard is screaming, come down from there, you can't do that. Well, it was too late. Because she wanted to see. And she saw. What I want you to do this morning is to be like the little boy in the car. I want you to hear what I say to you, but I want your hearts to be troubled and I want your souls to be downcast until you realize that you are the keepers of the mysteries of God. It is your individual responsibility. Wait a minute. Eh, don't do that to us. We hired these two and we pay them good salaries. We want them to do it. We expect them to do it. What are you expected to do? Did God say, go sing in the choir? Did God say, keep the sound system? Did God say, turn on the lights? Or did God say, ye shall be my witnesses? In Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and around the world. How many of the people that you know outside of this church that you spend time with know that you have been selected by God to be His steward in that place and in that time and that you belong to God because He gave His very life and bought you on Calvary's cross in order that you might be His steward of the mysteries of God. You see, a simple phrase becomes difficult to live with. And I'm not sure I'm following my outline this morning. But I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. When we talk about stewardship in the church, most of the time we think money, 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 money. And for most of you, you think no, 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 no. Well, as a young preacher, I had a superintendent named Clyde Boggs. Now Clyde was different. He just simply said, I expect that you're giving what you do to God back at your church every time they give you a paycheck. You know what my first paycheck was on Bladen Circuit in Bladen County? $4,250 a year. That's pretty good pay for a preacher back in those days. See, I'm ancient. I've been around a while. I know where all the bodies are buried. And I can tell the new bishops <laughs> more than they know. Do you hear? What do you hear? You hear my ego. You hear me. The only thing that I told the new bishop when she came, she said, Bruce, I know what your job is. You manage this annual conference. 
you manage the stage, you manage the floor. I said, no ma'am. I just do what God tells me to do. She said, will you, will you tell me if I can't preach? I said, I think you already know. Now you don't say that to a bishop. But she'd been around a while. We'd been friends. And she said, I think I'm pretty good. I said, yeah, we'll leave it at that. I'm making light this morning because of the informality I feel within this service. But I want you to hear what I think the message of the hour is. You are the stewards of God's amazing gifts. You know why you're alive this morning? Because God chose to give you one more day. God chose to give you one more breath. God chose to say one more worship service. And He does that like the ticking of a clock. But that clock will tick and one day He will say, time's up. You have fulfilled that what I have called you to do and time is up. And He will call you home. Or He will say to you, you've been an unfaithful servant, but I still love you. Come home. For you see, what He gave you was redeeming love. And also, He gave you the gift to be so proud. Phone rang at our house. Come down to our house for Thanksgiving. One of our granddaughters. We very hadn't, I don't think we'd been to her house but one time. And we walk in and she's so proud. And finally she says, Granddaddy, have you noticed anything? And I said, yes, I think you're gaining weight. <laughs> and she says, I am. And then she told me his name to be. She's going to have her second baby. And I was proud, and she was proud, and the whole world was proud. Because she told us we were going to be. And on the way home, I was thinking about this sermon. Was I more excited that day? When she told me about the baby that I forgot to mention to her that I'd like for her to get back in church and get back active with her relationship to God that she's had and to learn to take those children to the house of God, the community of faith where she could be blessed. And I began to think a little bit. I don't think my stewardship's been very good. I have not been a steward of that which God gave me to keep. For you see, it's not only time and talent and ministers and money, it's also your witness. Later on today, this we'll ask you to come and leave your financial commitment here in the manger scene. This church cannot survive without your willingness to give. But I want to talk to you today about why do you do it? Do you really understand, do I really understand what God did when He breathed into us the breath of life? He didn't have to do that. But out of love for Ken Hall, he said, Ken, come see my world. Come experience my creation. Come and learn what I can do. And the only thing, Ken, I want you to do is to turn around and thank me on Sunday when you come to worship for what I have done for you. Don't brag on the choir. Don't brag on the guitarist. Don't brag on the preacher. Brag on me. I'm the one. I'm the one that gave you all that you had. I'm the one generous to you. I'm your gracious Lord. I'm your King of kings and Lord of lords. You are my servers to serve the world in such a way that other people will know that I also created them and that I love them even as I have loved you. How much more, Ken, could I have loved you? Tell me something. Do you remember that first girl or that first guy that you fell in love with? My wife has a ball with me because the only girl I ever really dated before I met her, 
show, keeps showing up in my life unexpectedly. <laughs> and my wife has a ball with that. We went to a football game down in Rockingham and I turned around and she was sitting up on the bleachers two rows of time and she's a good looking lady. And before I knew it, she was hugging me and I was hugging her. And my wife was looking and you don't know how her husband was looking. There was a sense of, you blew it. <laughs> and she came down and she said, eh, they always do that. Yeah, it don't bother me. And he said, I don't even know who he is. <laughs> but listen to me seriously now. We have our love. We understand love. We know what love is. And all our Lord said to us, I want you to love me more than you have loved anyone you've ever met or anyone that has ever been a part of your life. Because without me, you are nothing. Without me and my love for you, you won't be here next Sunday. Without my sustaining grace, you have nothing. And all I ask out of you is that you be my stewards, my managers of the body of faith, of the church, of God's gift to the world, that you witness to my son and what he has means, what he has meant and what he means to you in your life today. And don't get mad with me, but hear me. I was prouder of a coming grandson than I was proud of saying to her, sweetheart, you need to get back in church in order to raise that child as God would have that child raised. And God convicted me. And I almost called Ken and almost said to him, I can't come down there. Because I can't talk about being a steward and a faithful steward to those of your people when in my life I don't find myself doing that. And God said, confession's good for the soul, but it's not going to get you out of that preaching experience. And so I didn't call Ken. But hear me this morning. If you've never heard the depth of the sincerity of my heart, listen to this. Mama, if I told you what they told me, you wouldn't have believed it either. Now hear me. What I told you this morning, even in the slow and easy way, is exactly what the Word of God says. You belong to Him. You have been bought with a price. And the price was the death of His Son on the cross of Calvary because He created you, because He loves you, and because He has a job and ministry and work and place and witness for you to do tell this world that you're different because you've been touched by the manifold grace of God and your life is no longer your own it belongs to him and you come to this place to be blessed but the blessing that you want is that you walk in here and you look at his cross and you say God thank you that I'm alive to be here this morning and thank you that you've blessed me with all of this. And thank you for the ability to come and praise you in order that you might receive the glory due you. And in order to carry that ministry on, I'm going to give myself, my time, my talents, my witness, my being to you. And I'm going to share the wealth that you've allowed me to have. And it's my decision. It doesn't matter if it's a nickel or a dollar bill placed in an offering every Sunday. It doesn't matter if it's $10 million. 
what matters is, is the openness of your heart to share what he's done. My son came to me and he said, Daddy, I want to buy a car. And he had just turned 16 the day before and got his license the day after that. So, I want to buy a car. And I said, no. And he said, I knew you were going to say that. You are going to say you're a poor Methodist preacher. You can't afford to help me buy it. I said, wait a minute now. You didn't ask me to help you buy it. You said, buy it. I said, there's a world of difference in that. And he said, I'll make half of the payment if you'll make half the payment. I said, okay. And he said, and you'll take care of the down payment. I said, are you broke? He said, no, sir. I just don't have any money. Are you broke? Are you broke? How about those of you? Are you broke? I want to tell you with everything I can tell you this morning, you are absolutely not. You are the richest God-blessed people upon the face of the earth. Because God loves you with His whole heart, with His whole high life. He even gave His very Son that you'd have the privilege of being in this building this morning. You are the stewards of the mysteries of God. And by God's grace and through His creation and His redeeming love, you have no choice if you love Him to be faithful. Christmas is coming. How much are you going to spend on your wife or your husband? Christmas is coming. How much are you going to spend on the grandchildren? And in our house, for the first time, how much are we going to spend on the great-grandchild and the one that's coming? Do you hear what I'm asking you? You see, I love them, and I really love them. Anything she wants, she pretty well is going to get. Any one thing my grandchildren, if I can help it, I can help them get it. And I'm going to do something special for those two great-grandchildren. I really am. She doesn't know it because she's already spent the money. But that's all right. Because I love them. You hear me? How much do you love the Lord? The Bible says He must be first. We're going to come in just a moment. Your minister is going to serve you communion. I'm going to receive that communion with you. I don't often get to do that. But it's a joy to kneel or receive it and to think as I receive what God has done for me. The Bible says that He is to be our first love. Because without His love for us, we wouldn't have any of the things we now love. And you're going to lose them anyway someday. Because the day will come when He'll say to you, come home. Your life is over. Your work is done. Come home. And my prayer for you is that you'll hear just simply this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the small things. Come and I will make you ruler of many because you are my stewards and have been the stewards of the mysteries of God.
Take a piece of bread, give it to the child's to receive communion, after which you may kneel at the altar for a time of prayer, or you may return to your seats. Well, that night, long ago, our Lord took a simple piece of bread from the table, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, I want you to take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, he took a cup from the table, again giving thanks to God. He said to his disciples, I want you to take this and drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord, we want to ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here today. And all these gifts of bread and wine, may them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly manner. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This time we'll ask our praise team and those who have been asked to serve to come.
closing invitation to this service comes in a very strange time. It's unusual in the giving season of Christmas that we're asked to remember the community of faith. But you know the ministry of this church. Many of you have been prepared in advance to serve this church, and I'm grateful for that. And I trust that God will richly bless you. But it is by your gifts that the ministries of the church, the body of Christ in this place, of which you are a vital part. And so you've been led, you've been taught, and I think I've tried to give you a guilt trip this morning, and if I did, I apologize. But I think the Spirit of God is absolutely more than we give it credit for being. And so this manger is a memory of his birth, and the blue is a memory of the royalty that he has. And now I'm going to ask you, if you're ready and prepared, to come and leave your commitment to the financial part of this church, to do that as a gift to God. And after you do that, you're dismissed from the service. So as you feel led, come, leave your offering, and then dismiss. We'll ask the ushers to come forward this time.